Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Cyber 1.2. And now please welcome the Chief Executive Officer of the Space Foundation, Mr. Elliot Pullum. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Cyber 1.2. How's everybody on this beautiful Colorado day? And I bet you all wish we were doing this outdoors today. It's going to be a lovely, lovely day. Well, thanks for being here. It's, uh, it's great to uh, have you all attending this third outing for our cyber event, Cyber 1.2. Uh, this continues to be a fighting domain uh, that is challenging in the extreme and growing uh, in its complexity and growing in its difficulty. Uh, there is a plethora of solutions, some of which are wondrous and some of which are, are confusing. And uh, it's, it's quite, a, quite a, a, a realm, quite a domain to try and keep track of. I, uh, I was online a couple days ago and, and just looking for a few statistics about what's going on out there in the uh, Internet today. <coughs> Number of Internet users in the world, 2.2 billion. One billion, or 45%, in Asia, 500 million in Europe, 22% of the global total. By, com by comparison, uh, in North America, we have 273 million users, so about 12%. So that is, that is quite a distribution, uh, and the ubiquity of this thing is growing. It's growing, and penetration is increasing in, in remote areas. Uh, if you look at the growth rates in Africa and the Middle East, uh, the Pacific and Oceania, uh, those numbers are, are growing exponentially. So as we consider the magnitude of our cybersecurity challenges, uh, one of the things that is most uh, apparent and painful and, and difficult to be mindful of is that 90% of the users in this domain lie outside the geography of North America. And that's a, a, a factoid that's kind of borne out by some of the patterns in cyber attacks. Uh, I was uh, looking at, uh, there's a journal, online journal called Tech Dunes. I don't know if that meaning to say that the Internet is a vast wasteland of dry and sandy nothingness. Uh, but Tech Dunes has rated the five most notorious online attacks, and of those, two originated in the United States. One from Russia, one from Germany, one in North Korea. So the challenges are global, they're growing, they're immense, they're immensely complicated, and hopefully today we can sort through, hello, feedback. Uh, hopefully we can sort through some of this complexity, and I know we've got some fantastic people here to help us do that and to help us get pointed in the right direction and offer us uh, some opportunities to interact with them and offer solutions that we might have to this vast challenge. I'm very pleased to introduce our opening speaker this morning because he's a gentleman I've had the chance to get to know here in the last few years uh, who really is one of the most remarkable guys uh, in this business, uh, as well as just being one of the most pleasant, friendly, affable, approachable people you will ever meet or work with, and that's Lieutenant General Mike Bosla. Uh, Mike is, uh, of course, the Vice Commander for Air Force Space Command and has the cyber mission in, the, in their jar, job jar. He has also been selected as Chief Information and Dominance and Chief Information Officer for the officer, Office of the Secretary of the Air Force uh, in the Pentagon. So he will be moving from one level of cyber complexity to uh, a larger level of complexity, although bringing with him, I think, the perfect view because of all of his insight into the Air Force system, which his command has been charged with protecting. Uh, in his current role, uh, General Bosla is uh, responsible for, for working uh, with our friend Willie Shelton and the rest of the team there, Air Force Space Command, to, to uh, train and equip and prepare for, for battle. Uh, more than 42,000 space professionals assigned to 134 locations worldwide. Uh, he also directs and, and coordinates the activities of the headquarters staff. Mike's a guy who's smarter than the average bear. He got his degree in mathematics, Bachelor's of Science in Mathematics in uh, 1975 and followed that up with a degree that I think he's the only person I've ever met that has this Master's of Science in Teleprocessing Science. So here's a guy that knows right down to the circuit boards and the ones and the zeros what's going on in this business and I couldn't think of a better guy for the job. Um, he's had previous assignments that certainly prepared him for this. He was the director of uh, 
He was in the Directorate of C4 Systems on the Joint Staff to Pentagon. Uh, he was the Director of C4 Systems uh, for the Joint Task Force Southwest in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. He was the Director of C4 Systems for U.S. Transcom and the Vice Director of C4 Systems, Vice, Joint, Vice J6 on the Joint Staff of the Pentagon. Would you please welcome our dear friend, Mike Bosler. <laughs> play music when you get up here and you get that great introduction. Elliot, thank you so much. I really do appreciate those kind remarks. Uh, I can't tell you how great it is to be here. Thank you and the Space Foundation for once again sponsoring this cyber event. And it's great to see so many um, uh, general officers, flag officers, active duty and retire industry leaders and action officers who hope someday to be sitting in these front row seats. Um, you know, as Elliot said, this is the third of these cyberspace events uh, that the Space Foundation is sponsored. Actually, I was invited to speak at the first one, and I thought, this is very cool. And then um, Elliot invited me back to speak last year to the second one. I said, well, gosh, I must have done a pretty good job. You know, I got invited back a second time. So now here I am for the third event. Now, I'm just wondering, Elliot, are you running out of options here, or, or just am I a cheap date, or what's the story here, you know? No, but it, it is a great honor. It is a great honor to represent General Shelton, uh, the 42,000 men and women of Air Force Space Command um, that you mentioned. And by the way, last year that number was about 46,000, so it gives you an idea of what's happening in our department. But, but I must tell you that the requirements haven't uh, decreased at all. I'm going to talk about... Uh, Last year I spoke about cyberspace, what we're doing. I'm going to talk about what progress we've made in the last year. Cyberspace is a part of every war fight uh, uh, mission that we're in. I'm going to address a little bit of that. Of course, with that comes risks, and what are we doing to mitigate those risks and remediate those? All simple stuff that we probably can solve in a day or two, but um, it's truly going to take a little bit of effort. Where There's a lot of effort going on in our nation. We've got the administration focused on cyberspace. We've got Congress focused on, Department of Homeland Security, the Combatant Command, Subunified U.S. Uh, Cyberspace Command, and of course, all of the services. May I have the next slide, please? These are a couple of cyberspace expeditionary warriors. Nope, there they are, cyberspace expeditionary warriors. Uh, they are standing up uh, the airfield in Chaklala, Pakistan and they just represent the kind of activity that we've seen over the past year. We've, it's been a busy year, and we've made measurable progress. We've developed, tested, and fielded, and operationalized multiple Department of Defense and Air Force defensive and offensive cyber operations capabilities. They include such things as the Air Force Information Operations Platform. Now, this is a platform uh, that's active as a network sensor at our gateways. And this platform allows us to add and subtract capabilities as, as circumstances dictate without changing out the hardware suite. We've developed and deployed a deployable cyber attack system for offensive cyberspace operations capabilities. We've reduced the number of Air Force Nippernet gateways, and I'm going to talk about that in greater de detail for passive defense capabilities. We've deployed the Griffin, a defensive counter cyberspace uh, weapon system. The Interceptor, a defensive counter cyberspace system for information assurance. And our network attack system, that is an offensive counter cyberspace capability. We've developed these and deployed these with a weapon system mindset. Hardware, software, certified operators, and that operational mentality that uh, gets at General Shelton's to operationalize and normalize cyberspace. Some major initiatives and investments over the past year. AFNET migration continues to be our number one cyberspace priority. Since last year, we've migrated over 167,000 users at 40 sites around the world, and we, re we have retired 27 legacy systems. We've changed the leadership of the AFNET migration. 
We now have the Air Force Network Integration Center responsible for that migration, and we have the 24th Air Force responsible for the operational acceptance. It's a single, centrally managed, homogeneous, more defensible network con concept and environment. Our goal is still to complete that effort in 2013, but I must tell you that a project of this magnitude is not without challenges. Um, uh, most recently here at Peterson Air Force Base, the regional processing center we were having problems with. We had problems with the servers that we bought. They weren't performing as we had anticipated. We had problems with our tactics, techniques, and procedures. They weren't fulfilling what we expected them to do, and we did not have the trained operators. I'm, I'm not happy to say that I'm going to completely replace those servers, that we've got better tactics, techniques, and procedures in place based on this strategic pause now, and we are buying the tools that give our operators visibility in what's going on in that, in that processing center. But our goal is still to finish in 2013, and we're doing some things to bring that back to the left. This will give us one email uh, for our career, but it still does not provide a standard configuration on our bases, and we're going to continue to attack that with the help of the 38th uh, Cyberspace Engineering and Implementation Group. From a policy and human capital perspective, very recently I co-signed a Cyberspace Operations and Support Community Transformation Plan as the Vice Commander of Air Force Space Command with the Secretary of the Air Force CIO. We signed this together because you got to have a strong relationship between the lead major command for cyberspace superiority and the SAF CIO. What does this do? It aligns and synchronizes Air Force cyberspace operations and support transformation with other Department of Defense and federal agencies. It creates a community that delivers broad range of decisive effects to the joint fight. And it provides operational focus for the community that's at the core of cyberspace operations in our Air Force. The 17 Delta officers, the one Bravo fours, cyberspace enlisted operators, and the three Delta Xs, that's our, our support cyberspace uh, warriors, and of course their civilian uh, equivalents. The result is this strong relationship, as I said, between the core function lead integrator and the CIO. And as Elliot mentioned, that's going to be my next job. So that's going to be so all the things I, I'm, I'm, I'm slamming them about today, you know, those are going to get much better in about two months when I get, I get not, not really. I love Bill Lord, and he's my absolute friend. And I will tell you, truly, we do have a great relationship. And we're on the phone. And I intend to be on the phone with John Hyten when I move to the Pentagon. Now, the next slide, please. We've also signed an Air Force uh, Guidance Memorandum, 3603, for cyberspace professional development. This was signed in December of, of 11. And it formally documents the cyberspace professional development program. This deliberate development program of cyberspace professionals ensures that they have the technical and the tactical depth and breadth through structured professional development based on career, long training, education, and experience milestones codified via three levels of certification. As of the end of March, uh, a few weeks ago, we had over 5,700 cyberspace professionals that had been certified. And this past year, over 8,000 total force personnel completed cyberspace-related training and education. And this is getting at one of our deficiencies that we've identified in the past, and that is capacity, growing capacity, and growing that professional force. Now the next slide, please. Well, these cyberspace activities um, are in the midst of, of, of a very tight defense budget, as you're, as you're all aware. So I had to spend a few minutes talking about what budget impacts are having on our cyberspace initiatives. The FY12 Palm resulted in a $1.2 billion reduction in our in 17 cyberspace program elements over the Palm. Now that money is gone, but I must tell you that uh, that $1.2 billion came out of the budget when we were when we were trying to find ways that we could save money, and I'm not pleased to uh, to report that unfortunately we did not have time to do the analysis that I think was required, the rigor that I think was required to find out where that $1.2 billion really should come from. 
So a little bit after the fact, we've employed the support of our financial management expert up at the Secretary of the Air Force, our Auditor Generals, and we said, hey, go take a look at those program elements. Tell us who's spending that money and what they're spending it on. They've done that for us. And they've come back and reported through business case analysis and, and audits that, yes, in fact, we may want to respread some of that $1.2 billion. We don't want to take it all out of the current core function lead integrator cyberspace portfolio. And we've got some help going on by the SAF CIO right now talking to the corporate structure and looking for some respread. We'll, we'll let you know how that turns out, and I certainly hope that it turns out in our favor. But let me just tell you the areas that we are focusing on in order to achieve that $1.2 billion efficiency. We're adopting enterprise services. It makes a lot of sense to have things like collaboration, workforce management, et cetera, in an in a, um, enterprise fashion. We're consolidating network ITs. We're building those area processing centers to, to um, support regional areas versus uh, the number that we have in place today. We're collapsing those Air Force gateways that I told you about. We did it on the Nippernet side. We're going to do it on the Cipernet side. We're migrating applications and services to enterprise computing centers versus uh, hosting an individual basis. We're consolidating and centralizing IT purchases. We were very successful when we did that with small computers. We're now looking at wireless devices. We are looking at uh, software licenses, and I think that uh, we're going to see benefits from that as well. We're eliminating legacy telecommunications capabilities, and we're adopting unified uh, communications. And finally, we spent a lot of money over the last 10 years um, uh, leasing uh, commercial SATCOM in support of our wars in the Middle East. As those come down, as we continue to deploy the worldwide uh, global SATCOM capabilities, we're going to reduce our commercial lease. What's the value of this? We're going to achieve economies of scale through centralization and standardization. We're going to improve mission effectiveness uh, through standardized information sharing tools. So if that wasn't enough, in FY13, the department gives us another $1.1 billion bill. And this bill was designed to eliminate duplication in IT applications for the 13 to 17 time frame. Now, why did we decide that this might be an opportunity? Because industry studies have indicated that corporations typically save 20% of their IT budget by eliminating duplicate applications. We got about 30,000 applications in our Air Force. But how did those applications get developed and how are they used? They got developed through functional areas, through mission areas, and they were not done in an enterprise fashion. So while uh, in theory this makes a lot of sense, in practice it's very difficult. I don't have a database that I can go to that looks at all our applications and look at their usage. And when I do finally find that two applications or multiple applications seem to uh, address the same purpose, you'll find that there are uniqueness in each of those applications that it makes it very difficult to eliminate one and support the other. By the way, members of industry probably have favored this type of practice in the past because it's more business. It's just a business that we can't afford to do anymore. So I'm going to, this is one of my jobs as I get up to the air staff is to try to get my arms around this as they're working today. In the longer run, when you start with a clean sheet of paper, we're going to develop enterprise solutions that help standardize IT applications across the Air, the Air Force. Absolutely, that's going to be an important thing. Now, the next slide, please. Now, um, cyberspace, as I've mentioned already, is closely linked to everything that we do in war. It is both a war fighting domain and we fight in, from, and to uh, cyberspace, and it's an enabling capability as well. Let me give you some war fight, war, a war vignette here. This is Tech Sergeant DeMasso. He's a Joint Tactical Air Controller. He's been deployed to Iraq on many occasions, and he's controlled 10 bombing runs in support of his missions in Iraq. But the results of those 10 bombing missions, with the support of space and cyberspace, Despite the fact that those bombings were literally happening just a few hundred meters away from Americans, no Americans were hurt. Many enemy combatants were killed. As, you, as no surprise to this audience, 
that was enabled because of GPS JDAMs that were GPS enabled JDAMs that were used. No mosques were scratched, no schools were harmed, and that's very important when you have a war of coalition partners uh, and you want to absolutely minimize collateral damage. This is an example. Cyberspace has changed the way we fight. We reduced the footprint of our forward forces and troops. And what does that mean? That means we have less Americans in harm's way. We reach back and, and use the capabilities that are at home station. And that means we have the full force of our Department of Defense to bring to the point of effect in the battle space. Let me give you another example. We use cyberspace and we use uh, satellite superiority in our remote piloted aircraft missions. Now, very dependent on the data links and the C2 links. And it's an opportunity for our adversaries uh, to get in the middle of that. Fact of the matter is, if I have uh, the next slide, please, that all dependence, that our dependence on these cyberspace and, safe, cy and space capabilities and the way we fight is not lost on our adversaries. They recognize that our United States is heavily dependent on cyberspace and its capabilities. They identify this and see it as one of our centers of gravity. They also see it as one of our uh, soft underbelly opportunities. And so our adversaries are looking at asymmetric opportunities to attack this, this soft underbelly. Let's talk about that RPA mission, for example. General Botrano will tell you that uh, she has been tasked in her role as the 24th Air Force commander to provide cyberspace ex es escort missions for those RPA missions. But she doesn't have the capacity complete to do all of those. And our adversaries know that as well. And we've seen lost links and return to station. And we have to do the deep dives and figure out what's causing those lost links. Let me tell you about another vulnerability that we have. Everyone in this room knows that we use the defense industry for research and development. And as a result of that, we have clear defense contractors. And we have had clear defense contractors who are doing um, 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 research for us that is very valuable to our adversaries. And as a result of that, they have infiltrated some of those defense contractor sites that are not properly protected and have exfiltrated terabytes of data. We've got to figure out how we close that gap. And actually, there's good work. Uh, in what's called the Defense Industrial Base Initiative between the Department of Defense and the Defense Interest Industry. Cloud computing. Everybody tells me we need to move to the cloud. I agree with that. But are we prepared to protect the data that I'm going to share with the cloud provider? So that data will be outside our defensive boundaries. And again, it will be a target for our, our adversaries. To mitigate these risks, We've got to operate in the cyberspace domain. We've got to continue to take actions designed to help us be capable of providing those defense risk mitigating strategies that I want to talk to you about now. Can I have the next slide, please? General Votrino also has uh, a group called Hunter Teams. They actively search for enemies on our networks. They provide the 24th Air Force mobile precision capability to identify, pursue, and mitigate cyberspace threats impacting critical links and nodes within the Air Force network in support of both theater and functional operations. These hunter teams provide an element of deterrence. But the question might be asked, how do we, how do we prepare? How do we train those hunter teams? And we've taken a page out of our air domain. I'm sure everyone in here is very familiar with our exercise called Red Flag that began in 1975. And what did we learn at Red Flag? We learned that by sending our combat pilots to that exercise Red Flag for their first 10 combat missions, they came out better skilled, better prepared, more survivable, and better effective when they got into the um, actual fight. And, and so we took that page out of history and we applied it to our 100 teams. So in Red Flag 12-3, we sent cyber defenders specifically the skulls of the 92nd Information Operations Squadron. These hunter teams were deployed forward, and they defended the C2 mission of the CAOC at Nellis. This was a first. They synchronized net defense in a predictable and a repeatable fashion with the ops tempo that was occurring for all integrated warfighting domains during that exercise. And ultimately, the advanced defensive counter cyber weapon systems, the tactics they developed, 
the C2 that they employed caused the aggressors who were part of that exercise to lose footholds in the networks and change tactics, enabling our defenders to hold the critical piece of cyberspace in that chaos end during that dynamic targeting and ISR operations in support of ongoing combat operations. I mentioned that we're collapsing gateways. We want to eliminate the numbers, uh, the, the threat vectors that our adversaries can, can come at us from. We've progressed from 100 to just 16 points on the Nippernet side where data enters the Air Force network. It's much more defensible and provide us a greater opportunity for situational awareness. In fact, the Department of Defense likes this idea and they're, um, uh, and they're talking to the Air Force and the other services about providing a joint information environment and I'm gonna give you a, a few more words on that in a moment here. We stood up a cyber warfare operations weapons instructor course. Again, barring a page out of our air and space domains. The initial cadre, which will be the instructors of that program, there are eight of them now in class and they will graduate in June. The first non-cadre class will begin in July and graduate in December and it will include five active duty members and a member of, of, of our um, reserve component. The Cyber WIC course will become more joint we have invited the, service, the sister services to participate, and we hope the first sister service graduate becomes one of the instructor cadres. And we're doing that at Nellis, as I mentioned, at the Air Force Warfare Center, uh, so that uh, cyber effects can be integrated with, uh, with the space and air effects that we are creating out there. Now the next slide, please. Another mitigation strategy that we use. It's a combined effort between OSD, DISA, and the services working to establish a set of criteria to define a system suitability to connect is what we call net worthiness. It considers items such as security, interoperability, sustainability when we add a system to the AFNET. Not only do we want to make sure that the new system doesn't bring with it security vulnerabilities that would gain the adversary a foothold, but we want to know that when we have to push a patch to plug some uh, vulnerability that was discovered, the system will be able to do, will, will remain stable and be able to absorb that. I mentioned the joint uh, information environment. Please pay attention, industry leaders, to this and, and military leaders. This is an initiative that was approved by the SECDEF in August of 10. It was advocated by the commander of U.S. Cyber Command. And General Alexander's position was that we can create a more secure environment as a, as a department than we can as individual services. It involves collapsing service networks into a joint network under central control, continuing to reduce our data centers, leveraging cloud computing, migrating service core services to a joint enterprise. It also provides increased capacity and speed so that we can do a better job analyzing what cyber attacks we have and do the defense against those cyber attacks. Next slide, please. I mentioned that our adversaries are well aware of our dependencies on cyberspace. Imagine this, just a single computer, this and an internet connection is a deter and a determined individual makes that individual cap a capable cyber enemy in every sense of the word. Last month, my boss, General Shilton, noted that cyber, at the Cyber Futures Technology Conference that in this era of network forces, our networks are our Achilles heel. For someone with the right brain power and the right cyber capabilities, a cheap laptop and an internet con connection is all it takes to become a major player in the domain. With limited time and resources, how do we deter that sort of enemy and mitigate our cyber Achilles heels? Well, instead of building greater, higher walls with our firewalls, the entire network, we have to focus on defense in depth. We have to assume the enemy will be inside our networks for malice, curiosity, or just for the challenge. And so we have to prioritize our defense efforts in a mission assurance approach. Next slide. Today's cyber world is 24 by 7, and we, and we are continuing to focus on that as our adversaries are. Our deterrence applies at home, in the office, 
and everywhere we are in cyberspace today. We've got to change the mindset. We've got to change the culture. We want our airmen who use their home and com commercial capabilities to use the same kind of good practices that we expect for them in, in the office. We w they have to become better consumers, though. They have to understand that uh, that website they're going to, that download that, they're, that they are uh, um, uh, doing, could create vulnerabilities in our, in our networks. Think about this. Every one of our airmen are very, very conscious of FOD on a runway. But our airmen, are, are they as conscious about those downloads? And are they as conscious about that thumb drive that they plugged into their, into their uh, desktop? I'm not so sure, and that's why we have to change this culture. It's fundamental to deterrence in affecting the adversary's expectations and behavior. If every airman is a defender, part of the neighborhood watch, when it comes to sense of ownership for the network, we can close a lot of unintentionally open windows. It's simplistic examples, but it contributes to the making the network more resilient to attacks. Not just the hunter team, because we certainly aren't going to have enough of those, and not just the network operations and security centers. Next slide, please. See, my time is out. Ladies and gentlemen, I try to give you an overview of what we have done in the last year in cyberspace uh, from a lead MAGCOM responsibility and from a SAF CIO responsibility. We talked about war in cyberspace. We talked about our dependencies. We talked about the adversary's awareness that it may be one of our Achilles heels and it certainly is one of our soft underbellies. But we've also looked at risk mitigation strategies and deterrence options. We've got to continue to refine those options just as we did during the Cold War era, era because this war is, it will not stop and uh, it will continue to escalate. I thank you very much for your attention. Again, Elliot, thank you and the Space Foundation for letting me address the group. And I look forward to a few questions if you have any. Thank you, General Brazzer, for those great remarks. Sir, first from the audience. Thank you. Sir, first from the audience, will Space Command and the Air Force use the cloud to increase efficiencies? Absolutely, we will. Yeah, so, so um, I, I've talked to some of you about cloud computing as well. So I think we're going to have a mixed bag of our solutions. I think we will create clouds in the Department of Defense. Certainly, DISA is looking at this right now. We'll create hybrid clouds with our industry uh, uh, partners. I think what we have to do is when we contract for such capabilities, when we look for such capabilities, we have to make security one of those key performance parameters so that industry can recommend your best practices and we have a sense that, yes, indeed, um, this makes sense for us to do business with you it, and it will uh, provide a good return on investment. Sir, you mentioned a strategic pause. Could you elaborate on that, please? Absolutely. We, um, I think it was about 60 days. Am I right, Ann? Yeah. 60 days, we stopped AFNET migration, if this is the strategic pause that you're, you're referring to. Why? Because this regional processing center that we had uh, at Peterson Air Force Base and we were depending on to, to migrate the front range into and parts of other uh, major commands was not prepared to accept uh, that workload. In fact, the system crashed. I said a moment ago that the service did not perform as we had expected them to. Let me give you an example. There was not any um, uh, failover, and we had backup servers. Uh, shame on us for um, probably not doing the diligence that we need, although we thought we had, in selecting the products that we selected. But as we went back, and did the forensics, we found those servers were not the proper servers for the mission that we had intended. And let me just tell you, um, uh, you know, and I'll be very transparent here. The servers I, I am replacing those with cost 10 times the servers I originally purchased. 10 times. So I invested in those servers and now I'm spending 10 times more in the replacement servers. And so not only did it cost me 60 days in the schedule, it cost me a whole bunch more money as well. Let me, let me sp spend another moment about um, talking about homogeneity too, because this is something I've struggled with my whole career. Um, um, our acquisition rules 
talk about competitiveness in an open, uh, an open envir environment for all industry to, have on, to be on a level playing field. But the fact of the matter is, that's not the best way to develop a defensive fighting capability that our warfighters are very skilled and trained on, that we need more homogeneity. And I promise you as the CIO, I will use the authorities that are invested in me in order to achieve that homogeneity. So that I say, this is the right service set for this application, and I'm gonna use it at Peterson, I'm gonna use it at Wright-Patterson, I'm gonna use it at Scott Air Force Base. And I don't wanna go through, maybe I'm saying too much here, and I don't wanna go through the justification, the JNA process to, to um, outfit all those processing centers with the same suite of equipment. I don't have the time or the manpower. I need to work with you and I need to work with our acquisition authorities in order to, in order to be able to do that. Yes, sir. Sir, what progress have you made on space and cyber integration and what are the priorities? A great question. Um, uh, let me, you know, we don't like to talk a lot about org charts, but, um, uh, uh, but the, Recent manpower reductions that our Department of Defense has, has, um, has received and the trickle down effect to Air Force Base Command forced us to look at the way we were doing business. We had been acknowledging for two or three years now since we took on the cyberspace responsibilities that we were not balanced in space and cyberspace. So, so we took this opportunity when we reduced the headquarters to look at our organization structure and we've created a more balanced approach to our requirements process, uh, to our operations process, to our sustainment process between space and cyberspace. Now having said that, truly, um, primarily that's on paper right now and we stood up the organization. What we haven't done yet is we haven't filled the, that organization with the experts we need on the cyberspace side of the house. In fact, our, la our last two in our current uh, director of operations have told me, I don't need a deputy for space. I need a deputy for cyberspace because they're gonna be, those, those directors are primarily space officers. They need to have somebody that's steeped in cyberspace and we can, we're growing that cadre, but uh, we have a long way to go. Then with regard to the integration of space and cyberspace capabilities, the other part of your question there, there is great work going on right now between the 14th Operations Center for Space at the 14th Air Force and the 24th Operations Center, uh, part of the 24th Air Force, a uh, 624th Operations Center, excuse me, um, uh, down in San Antonio. And they are looking for those opportunities where we can integrate the capabilities. I mentioned a couple of them in my presentation and we're continuing to grow that list. The operators out there, let me just tell you this, I talked to um, uh, fellow three stars that I'm friends with who are numbered Air Force um, um, operators, the, the, the general in charge of the Libyan operations, et cetera. And here's what they asked me for. They asked me for the menu of non-kinetic cyberspace capabilities so they can in integrate those into their planning processes so they can determine the best way to take out that target, whether that be a kinetic or a non-kinetic effect. Those are the kinds of things that are going on right now, and there's great work happening at the 24th Air Force that Joan Volchino will probably speak about during her presentation later on in the day. So you mentioned contractors are not properly protected. Is the info they need from the intel community available to them? Did I say that? Am I being properly quoted here? No. <laughs> no. Let me, let me rephrase, if I said it like that, let me rephrase uh, my sentence. The fact of the matter is that all of us in this country are under attack every day. That's the fact of the matter. Some of us are more vulnerable than others, including the Department of Defense. Some of the Department of Defense are more vulnerable than others. As a result of that, some of our adversaries have gotten into our networks and exfiltrated information. I mean, we certainly have heard about some of our advanced fighters, haven't we? We all know that. Sp some of our space systems, too. Okay, so the point is, and, and what's the question now? <laughs> now that it, I made my point? Is the information that they need available from the intel community? Ah, okay. Uh, okay, I hear where the question's coming from. So, the Defense Industrial Base Initiative and I was part of the, 
the um, uh, ground level. I was on the joint staff when this kicked off. And it was a result of uh, some of those exfiltrations uh, that have occurred. Now, we have, and this was a long process, we have signed agreements 1v1 between members of a company and the Defense Department. And that memorandum of agreement um, codifies what information we will share with them, what information they will share with us. There wasn't a great interest, by the way, on the industry side, and if I'm, if I'm saying this wrong, I'll be happy to be corrected for the record here. But I think the case was there wasn't a great interest on the industry side to do this in an open environment because it does identify vulnerabilities. So it's a very sensitive uh, uh, arrangement that we do 1v1, and we provide industry what we know, signatures, et cetera, and they provide us what they know. And so it's a symbiotic relationship and has improved our defense across the board. Now, last count I heard, that DIB uh, agreement had 30 industrial partners uh, involved. And, and I'm hearing some, seeing some head nods over here. So we're still at that level, bigger corporations uh, in the nation. So there's still work to be done there. Last question. Last one, sir. Can you discuss how Is it an easy one? I, I think this one is. OK. Can you discuss how we are protecting key critical infrastructures, for example, energy, here and at our forward bases? Wow. Wow. So I'll just say this. The industrial control systems have been a focus of attention recently. That there are vulnerabilities in our ICSs. That um, they were not, uh, you know, when they were built, they were not necessarily built with security vulnerabilities in mind. And let's, I mean, you know, from, um, uh, certainly they were, they were constructed with the idea of backup power, but not software vulnerabilities that we've identified, not protecting and being able to be upgraded. Many of these industrial control systems are hardwired, so they, are, they do not lend themselves to uh, software uh, I mean, security enhancements. I will tell you that one of the jobs that General Shelton gave me, I see a red light up here, one of the jobs you know, Shelton gave me, he is the um, certification and accreditation authority for systems we have in our Department of Defense. And uh, he has asked me to review these before he signs those as the designated accrediting authority. I will tell you that is probably the toughest job I have on my plate. Looking at a file and determining if I am willing to tell the boss that we have applied all the measures that we have at our disposal to make that system as secure as possible and that we will accept this level of risk because of the operational requirement. Industrial control systems are part of that list, but that may be on the lower end of, of, of where they stand as far as our progress made to date. So great question, and we need all, all of your help in order to improve those capabilities. It might be another one of those, you know, we're starting here, and we have to develop some new capabilities that we're going to have to do some um, remove and replace. Thank you again, ladies and gentlemen. It was honest, my honest and uh, uh, privilege and, and, uh, and uh, fortune to be with you again this year. I look forward to spending the rest of the week with you. Have a great day. <laughs>
mapping requirements with situational awareness and skill sets. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Mr. Riley Repco to Cyber One. <laughs> First off, I'd like to uh, also extend my, my thank you to the Space Foundation for this opportunity. It's, uh, it's also nice to be back in Colorado Springs to see a lot of very familiar faces. Um, um, and, and again, I look forward to meeting all of you. I'm, I'm all about collaboration. It's always nice to be able to, to open a presentation by telling the audience that each of you is smarter than you think you are. It's the makings of novels and poetry from Dickens to Gibran, that the best and the worst occupy the same time, that wisdom and foolishness appear in the same age, light and darkness in the same season, that joy is sorrow unmasked, that humans are suspended like scales between inseparable contrasting emotions, only at standstill and balanced when they feel nothing. These are the timeless words of our existence. We know it to be true for everything. There are many strategic parallels between these two odd sisters of cooperation and conflict. Like space, cyberspace is the arena where we've led the way in many, but, on, but, but, but not always. But our advantage is now under attack by people who use different rules different operating models, and think differently about the use of cyber in warfare. Importantly, we need to think our, importantly, we need to rethink our approach, to seek new approaches that leverages the wisdom of the moment, because continuing down the current path would be foolhardy. In cyberspace, wisdom and foolishness indeed peer, appear in the same age. Many believe we need better options but we will not prevail by throwing bodies or buildings at the challenges of cyberspace. The assessments to date indicate that in cyber, we are capability limited, both defensively and offensively. We need to fix this. Our first goal must be to prevent an attack. We do so in part by being prepared. This involves having awareness to the capabilities and capacities in advance. Failing preparation, however, we must accept our responsibility to be prepared to respond. We must do this while simultaneously acknowledging and protecting the basic freedoms of our citizens and with the protection of a peaceful shared use of cyberspace. This will require established partnerships we need to explore the outer bounds of such existing capabilities for our national preparedness of future challenges. I am sure that this list of necessary capabilities is long. Our networks are certainly safer than they were, but remain easily penetrated. The supply chain is not secure. And because computers are embedded in all of our systems, cyber attacks can be regarded as a threat not only to our network and information, but rather as a threat to all of our physical systems as well. But protecting cyberspace and our national infrastructure will require technical awareness. Modern warfare will experience cyber and kinetic and combined cyber and kinetic actions. We will need to have more creative options, options that leverage the diversity of expertise you will only find in the communities of the private sector. While on the Air Force staff, I was permitted to briefly transform this thought process, building a diversified base of advocacy. Our results unsurprisingly concluded we needed more speed, need to be open to creative and in some cases radical ideas, and we certainly needed more scale. Some of the other particulars of this 30-month tenure at the Pentagon included the remarkable opportunity to work with some of the finest 18th century minds still protecting their silos. We are still utilizing industrial age processes 
to manage information age commodities. The process doesn't fit. My personal observation of cybersecurity is that it has been one of reaction, and this domain is all about speed. Latency, latency breeds contempt. While existing military efforts are necessary, these efforts and investments represent the wisdom of the moment. Efforts are needed to increase the speed at which we develop effective cyber capabilities, as well as the awareness to the number of diversity of those involved in the process of innovation. The value of advanced awareness to capabilities and capacities must be understood. The implications of a better safe than Sony scenario has been financially cataclysmic for many without proper mitigation techniques. We need advanced awareness to maintain and advance the exquisite contributions that cyberspace brings to the operational, scientific, safety, and security of business assurance. Our responsibility is to acknowledge and to prepare to protect the nation in this new environment. It is the interconnectedness of cyber and its man-made origins that presents us with this opportunity, one which we have not leveraged well yet. Technology can enable selective secrecy, our ability to sanitize and anonymize. We have tested and shared the results of this capability as part of a proof of concept in the 2010 War Games. But I learned vision without the resources is pure hallucination. What all of this preliminary work did provide was an expanded reach. It widened our swath, providing awareness to the art of the possible. Cyberspace is occupied by humans. There is no CEO. As of last month, cyberspace occupies 30% of the world's population. It should come as no surprise then that it is occupied by some of the best and some of the worst, by both wisdom and foolishness, acts of aggression and peaceful protests, by those who have found a new way to have their voices heard, by new ideas that have not reached the attention of the masses, or by those intent on suppressing voices that do not echo their own. By a new class of talent, the so-called hackers, they are good and bad, expert and novice, pacifists and warriors, attackers and defenders by profound heroism and shocking injustice. It is a new domain, but it conforms to the timelessness of our existence. The advent of the internet was more than 40 years ago and created tremendous opportunities and new risks. Today there are 800 million friends on Facebook. On a slow day, there's more than 140 million tweets sent by microbloggers from mundane musing to hashtag revolutions. Two billion YouTube videos are viewed per day. It has become a new form of art. Just think of the potential of new ideas or solutions that can benefit the warfighter when collaborating globally. This is called leveraging the mix of talent. At a cyber colloquium held last November, one shared theme that was of no surprise was that in cyber, the nation is capability limited, both defensively and offensively. In principle, I agree, but my DNA understands the value of collaborating, that our capability and capacity are only limited by our decision to partner or not. During my tenure on the, on the Air Force staff, my focus was not on the acquisition side of things, grant you, as this is not my specialty. My parents were in fact married. But in transforming the mindset to the value of extending our reach to new ideas and to concepts beyond our traditional walls, borders, and into locations only limited by our imagination and a connection on the internet. We also participated in two war games with epic year scenarios that were designed to identify plausible futures and their underlying factors and drivers in such a way as to allow the military stakeholders to understand important directions for a given use, including important signposts to monitor as reflective of, important, of movement towards those or perhaps other 
futures. These games allow decision makers to consider adapting new strategy in the face of change, including mitigation, reconstitution, which frankly, we do not do well, or elimination of futures with negative outcomes or consequences. However, we also introduced as a proof of concept to sanitize and anonymize classified data. This further enabled the war gamers and the executive cell to consider the art of the possible, the new potential and value add for reaching into new, untapped global communities for potential solutions to our epic year challenges, all without exposing the warfighters' vulnerabilities. In this period of budget austerity, we're talking about a domain where there are shared risks, shared vulnerabilities. Why not consider a shared investment strategy between the public and private sectors? While existing military efforts are a priority and necessary, many of the same efforts represent the wisdom of the moment. Thought leadership needs to be placed in areas where we can increase the speed at which we can have access and develop effective cyber capabilities through programs which enable the diversity of those involved in the process of cyber innovation. This mix must include the various communities of the private sectors at all discussion levels. This can no longer be treated as lip service. There is no dispute that over 300 million new malware variants are discovered each year. Cyberspace occupants coexist in the physical world. Their physical and virtual world identities may be the same or not. There are those who seek fame consistent with their physical world existence and those who seek the protections of a virtual world's anonymity. But these malicious cyber attacks are not merely an existential threat to our bits and bytes. They are a real threat to an increasingly large number of systems we interact with daily, which includes our military satellite systems, the power grid, and even our automobiles. The best and worst indeed occupy the same time. Former Deputy Secretary of Defense Lynn said on September 28th in 2011 that cyber attacks will be a significant component of future components of future conflicts and that over 30 countries are creating cyber units in their militaries. He argued, it is unrealistic to believe that each one will limit its cyber capabilities to defense. But the question I continue to look for answers on relates to how well we know what some of the capabilities are that are being worked in and outside our borders. Having a trusted framework with the ability to immediately vector the necessary leading edge expertise to an organization seeking a solution is certainly not rocket science. But why? Why is it that despite billions of dollars in investment and the concerted efforts on behalf of countless individuals who are dedicated, that it still feels like we're losing ground? Understanding the value of not having a framework that enables collaboration to strategically leverage the domain is where much of today's challenges reside. The fact that the US government agencies are still looking still thinking traditionally is concerning. As we live in a time where distributed attributes rule, our current military vulnerability, I would argue, is our regimented style. To paraphrase Carl Sagan, we live in a society dependent on science and technology in which hardly anyone knows anything about science and technology, where our most innovative programs are also our most ad hoc programs. It has been argued that after a great deal of research and investigation concluded that the U.S. approach to cybersecurity is dominated by a strategy that layers onto a uniform architecture. The same study that we, that we do, the same study indicated that we do this to, to create a tactical breathing room. However, it is not convergent with the clever adversary and involving threat. The study went on to indicate that we're losing ground because we are in and inherently divergent with the threat. Regina Dugan, former DARPA director, recently pointed out such divergencies are the seeds to strategic surprise. So ask yourself, how would each of you attempt to do, or what would each of you attempt to do 
if you could not fail? Where would you look for that new and necessary solution when you already know the standard cyber solution probably won't work, but you must come up with an answer? Feel uncomfortable? I feel uncomfortable. Because when you ask it, you begin to understand that the feel of failure constrains you, how it keeps us from accomplishing great things, and we will accomplish great things in this domain, and only by extending our reach will some of our greatest challenges find new solutions. And then you will witness firsthand some amazing things. The path to truly new ideas, those which have never been done, always meet with some level of failure. Learn to collaborate on as many necessary steps along the way, and I only see success on the horizon. All the communities of the private sector offer tremendous opportunity to the warfighter within cyberspace. Having clarity to government requirements is a beneficial step. Indeed, creative, non-traditional thinking is needed in this dynamic domain. We must change a mindset about how we plan to engage the capabilities and capacities found in cyberspace for vital civil and national security missions or to protect our critical infrastructure. I am referring less to the what and more specifically to the how. It would be unfortunate for a national debate about the future of cyberspace to devolve into feckless commercial versus government debate during a time of fis fiscal constraint where extraordinary, inno extraordinary innovation in technical and commercial applications surrounds us globally and it's this partnership mentality that will drive this cyber ship of state on a steadier course. The world we now live in is hyper-connected, socially networked, and global. It includes another dimension that challenges our societal and organizational constructs, laws, and norms. Personally, the means by which we address these challenges from a technological and policy perspective have not yet evolved. I will argue that our traditional and or regimented thinking is not helping us understand the particulars of this domain. Speed and scale will only grow. A connected, motivated group can now accomplish tasks otherwise thought impossible at speeds and scales we're only beginning to understand. As Edwin C. Bliss once said, success doesn't mean the absence of failure. It means the attainment of ultimate objectives. It means winning the war, not every battle. Within cyberspace, the adversary will most probably get there first. We must ensure not to let them win. So just to be clear, I'm discouraging traditional thinking in this clever, continually changing, man-made domain where innovation resides. What we have to do is build the bridge between what we need and what the private sector solvers can provide. So how do we tap into the global talent of force and capability for innovation sharing? How can we benefit from leapfrogging development from what we seek today to where these solvers reside? We must challenge existing traditional perspectives. Ladies and gentlemen, WikiLeaks is here to stay. Our recapitalization challenges can only benefit from the expertise of the sometimes odd and uniquely talented collection of cyber talent. What are superheroes after all but those with special powers? Marvel's creations were invariably outsiders, not just special, but mutant, a little bit off, defiantly antisocial, prone to sarcasm and cracking wise, suspicion, suspicious of authority, both governmental and corporate. These uber geeks, without exception, have realized that they could run rings around the safeguards and defenses of most computer systems. These X-Men can make things happen that most others cannot. Knowledge is what empowers them. Ladies and gentlemen, the truth is that these mutants are very real, and they are among us. These guardians, as patriots, don't, see, don't only see the threat that no one else can see, but are also the only ones who can conceivably stop it. They are the last lines of defense at this point and the smartest people in the security industry. Clearly, the concerned, efforts, the, the concerned efforts of cyberspace will require the concerted efforts of many. My emphasis is knowing where the talent resides, what capacity is offered so we know where to throw the pass 
when we need to. In summary, the responsibilities for the U.S. government to acknowledge and prepare to protect the nation in this new environment. We must recognize the interconnectedness of cyber as well as the duality of purpose it has revealed. Peaceful instrument of global communications, economies, purpose, and productivity. An instrument for some with others having intentions to threaten. Indeed, to some extent, we are all protectors of cyberspace. Let me be clear, it will demand technical expertise at unprecedented levels, including in advisory roles during the formation of collaboration frameworks between both the private and public sectors, those, who ex those whose expertise warrants participation in these necessary policy discussions. These new frameworks need to be executable, enforceable, and of course sustainable. To be of use, such new frameworks will demand regular evaluation and adjustment based on the time scales and the compressed evolutionary changes of advances in cyberspace. We will have to move much faster than we're accustomed to, and we will need to collaborate with the private sector for guidance. We must both protect its peaceful shared use, as well as prepare for hostile cyber acts that threaten our warfighters' capabilities. Why? Because what we're dealing with is man-made. The need to partner on challenges takes away the onus of responsibility on one and enables the many. Not an impossible challenge, <coughs> excuse me, because amazing, never been done things within cyber require collaboration for those seeking a solution. George Bernard Shaw once said, if you have an apple, and I have an apple, and we exchange these apples, then you and I, then, then you and I will still have one apple. But if you have an idea, and I have an idea, and we exchange these ideas, then each of us will have two ideas. Cyberspace is but a vast network mirror that reflects the human race. Time to go idea chasing. As is custom in the United States, space policies are revised, updated, and reissued to adapt to changing situations. Former White House intelligence analyst and friend Kevin O'Connell feels the opportunity is here that this needs to become commonplace within our information-centric business as well. We must begin to change our mindset and realize that the current cyber technology solutions you are seeking, the special operations applications, your new cyber wings, your subject matter experts, many of them quite young, reside within these odd and uniquely talented groups found in the private sector. Our responsibility is for advanced awareness, is to identify this capability and understand the capacity that exists. Know what to integrate and where to invest based on the gaps that appear, and they will appear. To develop a better defensive and offensive capability, recruit a world-class team of small and big business, labs, academic, private equity, venture capital specialists, and open research up to the white hat hackers to improve your government position within cyber innovation. Your true cost is in not doing so. With the budget environment we face, my near-term recommendation is we must be bold first. Practicality will be overshadowed by politics in this upcoming election. In cyberspace, the best and the worst occupy the same time, wisdom and foolishness are of the same age. This domain is the partnership domain for us all to leverage. If you want the right fix, include the right mix. Thank you very much. Mr. Repco for those great remarks. Ladies and gentlemen, we will take a short 15-minute break now. Our thanks to Iron Bow Technologies for co-sponsoring this morning's break. <laughs>